Turn in your Bibles this evening to Philippians chapter number 3. We talked this morning about the serpents in the wilderness, book of Numbers chapter number 21. And why is it that the serpents uh, came in among the people? Yeah. Yeah, because God sent them there. <clears throat> All good answers. Why did God send them there? Because of their complaining. What had led to their complaining? Their unbelief. Their unbelief. So it starts where? Unbelief. So understanding the problems we have are this flesh. That's kind of where we got to at the end. And there was a couple of people still talking after and brought up some great points. Um, and there's a lot of uh, thinking that you could do around that whole uh, concept of the serpent being lifted up and the, the, the parallel that Christ himself made between that scenario uh, with the people in the wilderness and himself on the cross dying for our sin. He who knew no sin. Amen. He wasn't hanging there. Uh, you know, we sang a song this afternoon I don't agree with. Uh, at the Assisted Living Center. And I was the one singing it. I was sitting there singing that song. It's a good song. I mean, not every song necessarily stands up to doctrinal scrutiny all the time. <clears throat> but we sang the song, It Was My Sin That Held Him There. And as I'm singing it, I'm thinking, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it rhymes, and that's good. But that's giving our sin way too much power. And that's the problem I have with that. Our sin didn't hold him there. He could have come down and left us in our sin. He could have never gone there and left us in our sin. Our sin didn't have the power to hold him there. It was his love for you and I that held him there. And it's the love of Christ that constrains us as well. Amen? So tonight in Philippians chapter number 3, we're going to pick up a little bit, kind of where we left off in some degree, uh, because we left with the, the picture and the imagery of the crucified Savior on the cross. And you know, ever since uh, when, that, when that serpent was raised in the wilderness and the people were told, he that is bitten, let him look to that brass serpent that was actually probably more copper than what we think of as brass. And the study of the metals is interesting in and of itself. If you dive into scriptures and you begin to study uh, all the things that the Lord uses as types and pictures with gold and silver and brass, uh, and the meanings of all that, there's a lot there that you can dive into. There's no lack of material to study in God's Word uh, that's uh, very fascinating, very instructional to us. But ever, you know, that time happened uh, and the people would look spiritually ever since Christ was crucified, millions of people, millions of people that have heard the gospel preached have also looked to Jesus Christ for hope, for salvation for healing, the healing that we need most desperately of the spiritual kind. Healed from our sin. The Lord did say, didn't he, that he came to save his people from their sins. So I want you to think about that tonight as we have that parallel, hopefully in the backdrop from this morning. And Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sins. And I want to ask you, based on what you know from the New Testament, where is it that sin does its work? In the heart. Amen. Yeah. Think of what I'm going to say. <laughs> <clears throat> For those who are in Christ, see, we're in bondage to sin before we're saved. Right. You don't have a choice. You have no faith. You have no belief. You have no power. You're dead. How much power do dead things have? So, so bear that in mind, because dead things don't have power. So you have no power to do good, right? You have only the power to displease God. You're dead in sins and trespasses. So Paul teaches us that having come to Christ, been reconciled to God through his blood, that we now must put on Christ. In other words, for the child of God, you've been given by the Spirit of God the power to, for lack of a better word in this context, perhaps, choose. 
As a believer in Christ, you don't have to live under sin. You need to understand some things about how your flesh works. And Paul spends a lot of time teaching us about how... You know, it's amazing how many people that claim to be Christians still default to, well, I think. But we know from the scriptures that the the worst possible thing to default to is what we think. We've been given the mind of Christ. We have his word. Amen? Amen. So what should be the governing principle of my life? You know, so often even those who are in Christ by profession still continue living apart from this. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. We must turn to the Word of God. So sin works in our flesh. It works in our members. So when we're told to put on Christ, when Paul talked about uh, that he might know, uh, that if by any means he might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, he talked about being crucified with Christ. What is, what is the teaching? What is coming along with that? When he tells us to mortify, therefore, your members. What's, what's he teaching us? He's teaching us to learn to crucify that flesh. And we see Christ and his, his dead body hanging there on the cross when he died. And Paul said that he was crucified with Christ. What is that, what's that imagery? In other words, that that lifeless body is, is the body that died for sin. And that I, being crucified with him, am dead unto sin. And that I might live unto God by the Spirit. And then he goes on to teach that with the mind, he serves Christ, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So this is the uh, standing condition of those who are in Christ until he comes. It is. That you have been brought into uh, a relationship with God by Jesus Christ. That's the reconciled part. We're reconciled unto God by Jesus Christ. And now to walk with him and to live in him, to rejoice in him, and not in our circumstances and all the other things that that we get mired down into. So as we have kind of that backdrop and we turn to Philippians 3, 17 through 21, maybe we'll see some interesting things unfold. So Paul, we've spent a little bit of time in Philippians chapter number 3 over the past year. We we kind of keep coming back here, um, you know, a little bit at a time. Verse number 9, he's talking about, well, verse number 8, he's talking about all the things that he counted loss, which were the things of the what? The flesh. His own accomplishments, his own glory, his own praise, the things he had striven for, for himself. And he said he counted all those things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. In other words, I'd rather know more of him and him in me than to continue to live for myself. And he says, uh, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, right? The things that I can labor to accomplish that I can glory in according to the flesh, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. In other words, not that we don't uh, strive, but the glory is all Christ's. Thank you. That I may know him. This is what we talked about last time we were here. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Right? The power of it. So he's talking about the power of Christ in me to live a life that the flesh is crucified. He's not talking about that someday I hope to be resurrected. He already knew that in Christ. He's talking about the power of Christ's resurrection in his life right now by being dead to the flesh. He says that the he may uh, know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That's important. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. In other words, he's not, and we covered this before, but this is lead up. He's not saying, if by any means I hope someday I'll attain unto the resurrection. He's saying, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, the power of the risen Christ in me to be dead to the flesh. We might call that spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. He says, as many of you as be perfect, right? Mature. Mature enough in Christ 
that Christ in me by faith has overcome and I've been put aside the things of the flesh. And that's an ongoing uh, process of sanctification in us. Uh, it says in verse number 13, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, which is a contrast to what? What we saw this morning in the, in the wilderness with the children of Israel. What had they done? They couldn't forget the things that were before. They were always going back to the things that were before. There was no pressing on. That was the problem because they hadn't believed in the hope that they had been given. When God said to them in Egypt, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey, they did like most of us. They took three steps across the Red Sea and they said, where is it? Uh, where's the milk? Where's the honey? Where's the fatness? Where's the good of the land? Where's the, all the things of the promise? Where are they? Right? And what are we told in Hebrews? By patience. Amen. And, and the, the author of Hebrews even says, brethren, ye have need of patience. Right? And that's kind of us sometimes. You know? You go to McDonald's, you walk up. This is kind of a running joke in our family. You walk up to the counter. Yeah, I'd like a number two with a large Coke with no ice. Uh, where is it? Because that's kind of what we expect sometimes. And we live in that kind of a culture where as soon as it leaves my mouth, I just, where is it? Is it? Yeah. Well, we do that sometimes. He says, no, I'm pressing toward the mark of, for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. We all know the church answer. We all know it. The highest calling in your life is to follow Christ. We know it. But do we believe it? There's a difference. Do we believe that that's the highest calling in life? Paul says this high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, and we're going to get into it tonight. So let, there, let us therefore as many as be perfect, or those who are mature and complete in Christ, be thus minded. And if anything be, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so ye have us for an ensample. In other words, be followers together of me. The, the thought literally is to be an imitator, that we might imitate what we, the people he's talking to, that they might imitate in their life the things that they've seen in Paul's life. And that they might mark. And that word is scopeo. That's why we tell people to, hey, scope this out. Scopeo. What are we saying? Look at this. Observe this. He's saying that we ought to mark these things, to observe them, to contemplate that example. And that example is literally a type. And it's the, the, the word actually means a figure formed by a blow or an impression. So he's telling them this in verse number 17, to mark them and to walk so as you have us for an example. Now we've talked about before in scripture, walk and live. Right? We live by faith. It's the means by which we have life. We walk, right? That's as we're progressing through life. What, is, what typifies your walk? So as we, as we come to know that in verse number 18, this is where I want you to look to tonight. In verse number 18, for many walk, Right? There are many who walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. The enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation, or literally our what? What is it? This particular word of conversation is not manner of life, if memory serves correctly. This refers to our citizenship. Remember we talked about that sometime back. So he's talking about uh, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words... If we're looking unto Jesus and following after him, where is he? Heaven. 
He's in heaven. Right? So we're looking unto heavenly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. So everything that we uh, live for and about are heavenly things. This is the type that Paul is saying. Because what, what did he just got done explaining? How he had died to all that fleshly stuff. He just got done saying how all of that stuff, he had shed it off. All the things of the flesh that he used to pursue and live after and want and desire. And that he gloried in and that he boasted of. That he had died and shed all that stuff away. And now he was living unto Christ by the power of the resurrection and looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. Notice what he says. Who shall change our two words? Vile, Vile body. You know, as fallen creatures, we don't really have a good um, understanding of, of what it meant when Adam and Eve fell, do we? I mean, we look at, you know, you, I picture Moses coming down from Mount Sinai when he had been uh, fellowshipping with the Lord uh, face to face and visiting with him and talking with him. And when he came down, his countenance shone so brightly that they asked him to cover his face with a veil because they couldn't look upon his face just from being in the presence of God. Now we look at one another and we don't necessarily associate these bodies we have with the word vile <laughs> all the time. Actually, we spend quite a lot of time trying to take care of them and, and be good stewards of them. But what is actually the case? The truth and the reality is that because of sin, they are vile. Amen. That this body of sin is vile. And he says that Christ, when he appears... He shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Amen. Okay, very good. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. In other words, that body of sin, this body of death, this vile body is going to be subdued by the power of Christ. And the Bible tells us, then shall be brought to pass that saying, death is swallowed up in victory, because this mortal must put on immortal. So by the power of Christ, he is able, amen, to subdue even this vile body and to bring it into subjection, because he's greater than all. He's greater than all. He's greater than, uh, and that's why he tells us to fear not, right? He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So we have a lot of hope in Christ, among which, probably too numerous to count, is this hope, that this vile body that now plagues us by sin will be subdued completely to Christ. And what do we know of Christ? That Christ uh, was completely submitted to the Father in his perfect will. Now what that tells us as there's coming a time whenever this vile body will be changed, subdued by the power of Christ, so that in us as well will be fulfilled the perfect will of God. See, we don't even know what that means because we're so estranged from the eye. We're so used to contending with a vile body that to have all of those layers unraveled in us where sin works in our members and it's corrupted our mind and it's just something we have to contend with. The Bible says there's a day coming in which that won't be the case. Christ will totally subdue this vile body. So I want to I just break this down a little bit tonight because in this passage, Paul says that there are those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now that doesn't make good sense. Knowing what Christ died to accomplish, who would be an enemy to that? Who would be an enemy to what he seeks to do in us? If it be that glorious, if it be that great. Well, there's a number of people, and he gives us this. And, and the way he explains it, it almost seems like he's taking it from the end back to the beginning. So if you turn to, in verse number 19... He talks about these enemies of the cross of Christ. And when he says the cross of Christ, I, I find it interesting at least that 
in this passage, you know, Paul talked a lot about the gospel. More so than probably any other writer. He talked a lot about the gospel. But he doesn't just say here that these, these people are enemies of the gospel of Christ. He says very specifically they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, something very, I mean, all of, all of those things that pertain to life, and dealing with sin happened at the cross. But Paul says very specifically, these are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So we know on the cross, Christ dealt with sin. And actually, if you look at a picture of the tabernacle and the temple, you see that picture, don't you? You have uh, just the break in the delineation between the use of metals in the holy, holiest place uh, the holy place and the outer court and all of those things where that metal was used is God dealing with sin. And where God dealt with sin was on the cross with Jesus Christ and, and put it, uh, he, he dealt with sin once and for all. That was the final blow. At that time, sin was dealt with eternally. And that's, that gives us a lot of hope. Amen. But the power of his resurrection is our hope of eternal life. Because we know by his resurrection that his atonement was efficacious. It was accepted by, the, by God. And so the testimony of God concerning Christ is that he was received because he rose from the dead. right? So just like the high priest who came back through the veil. What does the Bible tell us about that veil with Christ? It was his flesh. So he came back through the veil. In the, in the flesh, the resurrected, risen Savior, according to his glorious body, giving us hope that for all who put their faith in him, that he has been accepted. But this dealing with the cross of Christ is something very, it seems to me, um, now I'm not a doctor. Uh, I, I'm, somebody told me the other day I could call myself that. That'd be interesting. Um, so I'm not a doctor of theology. I don't have a PhD. I've not been to all these places. But it seems to me. That when I read this passage, when he says that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, that that's communicating a specific element of the gospel. Not just the gospel at large that they are enemies of, but what happened at the cross. Because the gospel is, is more than just the cross. But here he doesn't say they're just enemies of the gospel. He says enemies of the cross. Well, the scripture has some very particular things to teach us about what happened at the cross. So it just kind of got me to thinking. But these men in verse number 19 are described to us. And like I said, it seems like Paul starts at the end, mostly to me because he starts with the end. In verse number 19, he says their end is what? Destruction. Destruction. Well, you and I cannot, we cannot judge people by their ultimate end, can we? Not one person in this room has ever seen anyone's ultimate end. We've not seen it. We don't even know uh, the, the scope and the fullness and what that's going to look like and how it's going to transpire and how it plays out and how do I relate those things to myself. You can't. You've never seen it. You've never experienced it. You've never witnessed it. You can only read about it in the Word of God. So you must accept it by faith that the one person who's ever risen from the dead by his own power is qualified to tell us about what awaits beyond that veil. So we can't judge by their end. So he goes on from there that their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. It's interesting that the crucifixion of Christ is applied to us very specifically. I want you to turn to Galatians 5 and verse number 24. Right after we have the fruits of the Spirit, I'm sorry, fruit of the Spirit, singular, almost messed up there, would not be the first time. <laughs> Just to let you know, I'm flesh and blood. Make mistakes quite often. The fruit of the Spirit is laid out for us in Galatians 5, 22. And, that, and, and what does the fruit of the Spirit follow? Well, he's just gotten done explaining 
the difference between the flesh and the spirit. So he lists all the kind of things that work in the flesh, and then he talks about the spirit, which it makes good sense that these are quite opposite. You can examine the lists yourself, and you come down to verse number 24, and he says this, having explained the differences between the flesh and the spirit, he comes down to verse number 24, and he says, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Do you see that in your Bibles? It says that those that are Christ's have crucified those things. So here the crucifixion of Christ is related very specifically to that, that, mil, that moment or that place or that time when we died to the flesh. And how was that accomplished? By the crucifixion of Christ. I want to continue to, to follow this because this shows up in Scripture in a number of places. But we see it very specifically here, and he says, verse number 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk. There we have it again. This idea in Scripture of living and walking. Right? If we've been made alive by the Spirit of God, then our walk will be in the Spirit of God. So we have this idea of living and walking. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. What's vain glory? It's any glory you get. Amen. That's the bottom line. Any glory that we get, somebody speaking well of you, and you don't give the glory to God. How easy is that to do? It, it's easy. Those moments have happened in my life, and you, and you leave feeling convicted because someone ascribed something to you, and you stood there and took credit for it. We ought not do that. That's vain glory. The true glory belongs to God, and we should always reflect it back to Him. Someone ascribes anything to you that's worthy of credit, then take time to give glory to your Savior. Amen? He is the one who's worthy of the glory. So let us not be desirous of that, because that speaks to the things of the flesh. Provoking one another, envying one another. We can skip right over that, because nobody has problems with that. <laughs> but back in Philippians chapter number 3, we see that these men, their God is their belly. But what does Paul say? That the crucifixion pertains to the flesh and its lusts. So if you're an enemy of the, of the cross of Christ, not just the gospel at large, but the cross, then what are you seeking to do? You're seeking to continue. Because remember, these people, a lot of them, didn't necessarily reject uh, the idea of Christ. They just tried to mingle it with a lot of other things that they wanted to keep. Whether it was circumcision from the law or different pieces uh, of the law that they said were also required for salvation. Uh, and that's what the book of Galatians is all about. Trying to uh, form some new gospel, which Paul said is not a gospel. It's not even good news if it's not the truth. And so that's what they were trying to do. But at the cross of Christ speaks to the crucifixion of the lusts of the flesh that I have. Paul says these men, their God is their belly. And yet... They, they have enough assimilation into Christianity to take on some form of godliness, but not so much that they could say with the book of Galatians that they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Secondly, we see that their glory is in their shame. There's uh, plenty enough of that to go around today to speak of at length. But we see in Galatians 6.14 something that I think all of us should reflect well on. Uh, and you can just turn right back over there because it's just a few pages. In Galatians chapter number 6, and you guys already know this verse. You, already, you probably said it in your minds before we ever turned over here. What was Paul's view? Remember, what, what, what had Paul told them to do to imitate him? Because the, the power of the Spirit of Christ in him was mighty. He says that. The working of that Spirit of Christ in him was, was worked in him mightily, he said. 
we could be an imitator of him. And he said, God forbid that I should glory. We could stop right there and spend a little time. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says. Here he says it again. Save in the what? The cross. And so there's something very specific that he's about to make mention of here when he's talking about the glory that he wants to glory in is in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Amen. In other words, the process by which God separated me unto himself Amen. was the death of his son. Amen. Because the blood of Christ was necessary for me to be reconciled to God. I could not enter into the presence of God in fellowship having sin. I have to be cleansed of all sin to be in the presence of God Almighty. And yet if I'm not cleansed from all sin, I can't enter into fellowship, then I am, then I am damned to eternal death. Quite a predicament to be in. So Christ reconciles God and man by his blood, and that happens at the cross. It's a very specific part of the gospel. The shedding of the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all sin so that we, who are sinners, enemies to God, alienated from him in our mind in time past, could be reconciled to him by being accepted in the Beloved. We're accepted in Christ. The Bible says we're forgiven for His sake. For His sake. Amen. Amen. So it's about us being in Christ. And that all of that happens at the cross. And Paul says if he's going to glory, he's going to glory in the cross because it's by that cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that the world is crucified to me and I to the world. So that is the demarcation of those who are separated unto God out of this world as his peculiar people, the sheep that were lost, that have been returned and found. And how is that made possible? By the blood of Christ at the cross. So when we're talking about enemies of the cross, what are we saying about these folks? That their glory is in their shame. In other words, the things that should be shameful, the things that pertain to the flesh, the things that pertain to all temporal things are the things that they choose to glory in. Paul said there's one person to glory in, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Always be wary in your mind of yourself when you start to feel a sense of pride about something, yeah. whether, that's, uh, whether that's righteous living, whether that's that you have learned and grown in Christ and you are now... Uh, because of his deliverance that he has brought into your life by his spirit, if you start to feel a sense of pride and accomplishment, be wary of yourself. Amen. What is, what is the, the problem? What is going to bite us? It's the flesh. That's the picture we have from this morning. Our own flesh is from what we need to be delivered. And our hearts are desperately wicked. And so we can't trust them. We have to trust Christ, which causes us to walk very humbly with our God, which is how we should walk, because we're sinners saved by grace. Amen. It's not in our own standing. We have nothing to glory of. We have nothing at all to recommend us to one another or to God. There's nothing about us that recommends us to him. It's by his grace. The Bible has concluded all under sin. There is no difference. You're either accepted in Christ and as righteous as he is himself by faith, the gift of God, or you're a sinner that's condemned by your own nature and choice. But there's no middle ground. And there's no difference between anyone who's not in Christ. There's no hierarchy. It's all an illusion. It's a sham. It's a, you get it? It's the deceit of our mind that tells us I'm a step above other people and I'm here and you're there and you're worse and I'm better and, and he's a little better than me, but I, I'll get there. And that's all, it's all a sham. The only thing Paul said he would glory in is in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Now, did Paul's life, if we examine his life and scrutinize him, would you say that he was blameless? I would say he was blameless. His life did not give you opportunity to find fault because he was following Christ. You would have been hard-pressed. Now, there were people who nitpicked at him, right, about his presence and his delivery. He might not have won many preaching contests. He says of himself, I was with you in weakness and in fear and trembling. And sometimes we get the picture of him as kind of a thunderbolt guy. And he's, I don't think that was necessary. You read his, the things that were said of him that he said of himself. I don't know that that was correct, our, our image that we have. And it's probably, uh, it's probably askew because when was the last time you met somebody that you just heard about? And you're like, that's exactly how I pictured him. <laughs> it never is, right? It's never what you think. Every time you meet somebody, you've talked to them on the phone or somebody's told you about them, and you finally meet them, what do you say? That's not at all what I expected. I thought they would be something else. So we mislead ourselves quite often. So they glory in their shame. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 5, 44, How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Glory seeking will hinder your faith. Yeah. It's all through the scriptures. Glory seeking hinders your faith. It's not about you. It's not about your reputation. It's not about maintaining some semblance of, of perfection for others to really revere and see. Because as long as we're doing that, they're not seeing Christ. Because right. they're not seeing that we have confessed to our sin and our true state and that we rely on Christ because he's the one that's perfect. He's the one that's righteous. He's the one that's holy. He's the one that has ascribed greatness and power and might, glory, blessing, honor, and strength, and all of the other things that the scriptures ascribe to him. So while I'm trying to maintain some facade uh, of righteousness for myself, I'm hindering the cause of Christ. And that's what these men were doing, glorying in the flesh book of Galatians, they would make a fair show in the flesh, and it hinders the cause of Christ. We need to understand that as children of God. Any righteousness that we put on for ourselves other than Christ hinders his cause. It hinders his cause. It hinders the gospel. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because it, it compels us to be brutally honest with the world about ourselves. Amen. You know, the world has a perception. I was talking to someone the other day. Uh, the world has a perception uh, that church is a country club for the righteous. And that's not wholly unearned, that reputation. Amen. It is not wholly unearned. But it's a shame because if they knew us, <laughs> if they knew us, the, the thing is, we have to be honest with them about ourselves to let the glory of the gospel of Christ shine through your life. Then all of that has to be peeled away. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, I've suffered the loss of all those things because they hindered the glory of Christ in me. Because as long as people think I've got it together, they don't understand my reliance on the promise of Jesus Christ. That I don't hope to stand before God in my own righteousness. How many times did Paul say it? He was always preaching the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We have to be that as well. So these glory in all the wrong things, seeking their own glory. They also mind earthly things. You'll see in verse number 19, their God is their belly, their glory is their shame, and they mind earthly things. James 3, 13 through 16 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? He was kind of a straightforward guy. I don't know that that was a rhetorical question. He might have actually wanted them to think about it and give an answer. Uh, that who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. There we have manner of life. His works with meekness, meekness of wisdom. His works with meekness of wisdom. You see the pattern? 
Because there's, there's a lot of danger to us when our fleshly mind gets puffed up. You'll always see meekness. What did Paul tell Timothy, or maybe it was Titus? In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure, God will grant them repentance. You know, we have to be at that place of meekness. Why? Because it's not our glory. It's not our righteousness. It belongs to Jesus Christ. So this mining of earthly things speaks again to that old carnal nature we have. He says, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. In other words, when we have strife and envy in our hearts, don't mask it with some perception of godliness that says, you know, well, yes, there's strife and envy in my heart, but I'm going to try to put this little skin over it to make it look. He's saying, no, don't glory in it. Just confess it as sin. Just admit that I have a problem with strife. I have a problem with envy. And I need Christ's help in my life to, to, to die to that, Amen. that envy that works in me. But we oftentimes try to create this uh, whatever we can find. <laughs> Humans are so good at it, right? We're good at self-justification. We're good at finding ways to gloss over and clean up our problems. He says, don't glory and lie against the truth. We ought not do that. This wisdom descendeth not from above. In other words, the wisdom that we use to try to be crafty about our presentation of self. That kind of wisdom. That works, that works in our hearts all the time. But James says that kind of wisdom that will lie against the truth, because what is the truth? Why did the Pharisees not receive the testimony of Christ concerning themselves? Because he testified that their works were evil. And they didn't want to be sinners. He said, not us. No, no, sir. We're not sinners. We're righteous. And they became liars. And now they're guilty before God. What's the truth? If we do the truth, we come to the light. And you have to confess the truth to walk with God. The truth is that that's not the wisdom from God at all. This kind of wisdom, the kind of wisdom that wants to polish up self to present a good image of myself, this kind of wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. What did Paul say? They mind earthly things. James says this wisdom is earthly, right? It's also a few other things he calls sensual and devilish. That word sensual just means our very base nature, the basest of human nature that we come forth from the womb with. That's that sensual nature, the nature that's only concerned with the senses that we have by nature, what I can see, what I can experience, you know, all of those kind of things about this creature that God gave us to use for his glory. What did Paul say? The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. That's how it was created to be. But we have corrupted it and used this creature to serve ourselves. And the, the gospel of Christ wants us to confess. So these who have these things in their life are the enemies of the, cro of the cross of Christ. You'll notice the contrast of the enemies of the cross of Christ to the true example we have of Paul, who said, by the way, if I were to glory in the flesh, <laughs> right, if I was going to speak as a fool, if I was going to speak as a man, if I was going to glory in the flesh, I have a big old long list of things that I will put against anybody's list. Right? But he said that's all meaningless. It's dung. It's refuse. It's, it's of no value. It's of no profit. It's not going to add anything to you. If you only have the glory that comes from men, that leaves as soon as you're dead. You seek the glory that comes from God by speaking forth the glory of Christ and that glory that he will share with you is eternal. So, so many times we're tempted by our own hearts to give up the things that are of the most value because we're fighting over something dumb. How many relationships between parents and children have been ruined because fighting over temporal things? How many inheritances have gone really bad south uh, and people are estranged from their loved ones over stuff? But there's only, in, there are only things on this earth that are eternal 
are the souls of the people. That's it. The Bible says lay up treasures in heaven. What's the only thing you have any hope of taking with you from this earth? It's, it's souls. It's people. And we often devalue people to fight over stuff. But God calls us to use the stuff to love the people. Flip it around. So these enemies of the cross of Christ, I believe, are enemies to the gospel in a very specific way. Because they teach a gospel that allows for the convoluting of the flesh and the spirit. Paul didn't preach that gospel. You won't find a gospel that Paul preaches where he compromises the things of the flesh and the spirit. He understands there's a struggle, but concession is not in the, it's not in the hand. You're not, you're not going to find anywhere that Paul says compromise, concede, I don't remember reading anywhere in here where he uses the phrases like, hey, we're all human. No, it was always combat. Because what is it that troubles us? What is it that bites us? It's our own flesh. It's our own fleshly nature. The desire to be perceived well. The desire to have some glory. The desire to give me my credit. The desire to be esteemed. The desire to have possessions the desire where do all those desires come from from the flesh and you can read all the ways that paul talks about the flesh but you'll not find anywhere in his gospel that he concedes anything it's always striving to crucify that god you know i was thinking about that with this the serpents in the wilderness if that serpent that you were looking at and josh pointed out this morning there's some good types there with the the brass serpent because it didn't have any venom in it, did it? It was just reflective. And just same too, Christ had no sin. He's showing us. And so you see that, you see that serpent? Knowing that, I mean, the first time the first serpent comes around and bites somebody, you might be irritated. Because um, you didn't see that coming. Uh, if they kill over dead in a few hours or days, now you're grieved. The next one comes into the camp and bites this other guy. And he's someone you actually liked. <laughs> now you're angry. What are you going to do the next time you see the little other third snake come coming along through the camp? What are you going to do? You're going to stomp his head off. You get me? Yes. You're going to stomp his head off. You're tired of the stupid little snakes killing everybody. That attitude should be ours. Yes, amen. That attitude, we should own that amen. because it's us. It's this flesh. And it crops up in a moment. And we don't catch it. It crops up in a moment of weakness or we act too quickly you ever act too quickly? <laughs> you act too quickly. You're probably not going to have, have the spirit. The Bible teaches us what comes first. The flesh. Who came first, Ishmael or Isaac? Ishmael. What always proceeds forth first? The flesh. Are you born naturally and then spiritually? Like That's always the progression. So when you run out ahead, you're gonna, your factory default settings are flesh. So when we act too quickly... What's it going to be based in? The spirit? Not likely. The flesh. Then don't act quickly. Don't be rash. Walk in the spirit. Take time. Wait on God. Pray. Ask him to speak to your heart, to communicate with you by his word and by his spirit. That's how we say he governs the church. Amen? By his word and by his spirit. Christ is the head of the church. He governs it that way. Let's live that way. If our flesh is the problem, and we've seen it, and we've known it, and we've been taught it in Scripture, then that's, that's an important understanding for us to have about ourselves. About ourselves. Because that is the problem. So those who are the enemies of the cross of Christ, I believe it's speaking of this very specifically. And in Romans chapter number 7, you guys probably all know the verse. 
other things pertaining to this body, Paul, Paul pleads in Romans chapter number 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he goes on to say, I thank God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. What did he want to be delivered from? Same thing that Israelites want to be delivered from, the serpents that were snaring them and biting them and wreaking havoc in their camp. What do we need deliverance from? Our flesh. The body of death that we need to be delivered from. So many other places in Scripture. I'll leave you with two other uh, uh, verses of Scripture. We'll close for the evening. Galatians 2.20. We all know it. I am crucified with Christ. Who's he talking about? Paul. That old, that old man, that old nature, that flesh. He says, I am crucified with Christ. When he's talking about being enemies of the cross of Christ, you know, in our modern time, we've had the same conversation, haven't we? The, we've had people split off because they don't believe in biblical separation. Enemies of the cross of Christ. Yeah. The cross of Christ is all about separation. Amen. It's where separation happens. Yeah. And those who go on saying we can believe Christ, but we can still live after the flesh are enemies of the cross because the cross speaks of separation, being crucified to the world and the world to me. My old priorities are not the same. My old thinking's not the same. The way I live is not the same. The way I compromise away all my values is not the same. The way I'm my own authority is not the same. I've died to all those masters, and now I've acknowledged the one true master in heaven, Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He's my Lord. He's my master. So he calls the shots. Amen. He tells me where to go. He's the pillar of fire. He's the pillar of cloud. He shows the way. He's directing. He's leading, and I'm always looking to him. The cross is all about separation. So when Paul says that there's enemies of the cross, that's, I believe that's exactly what he's saying. Not just the gospel, but the cross. The place where the blood of Christ was shed to separate me unto God. And now he feels in his heart a compunction to die to his flesh and to live unto God. And we should feel the same. He says... Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. By what power? By the power of the resurrection, the power of the risen Savior in my life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 6, 6 says, speaks on this wise, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The old man's crucified with him. So what's an enemy of the cross going to say? Enemy of the cross is going to say, we can still live in the flesh. We can still live after our own desires. We can still please ourselves. And this has been going on from the beginning of the gospel being preached. That people would say, let us do evil that good may come. In other words, Christ died for my sin, so let's just live it up in sin. And all the more glory to God for paying for my sin. But he said he came to save us from our sin, and he has, because sin works in this flesh, and it's been put to death with Christ at the cross of Calvary. Amen. So if that's my lot, then my old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, what body of sin? The one you're living in. That body of sin, that vile body that you have, that's vile because of sin, vile unto God. It's unclean because of sin, that that body might be destroyed. Does that sound like a gospel of compromising and just kind of saying, well, it's just, you know, no. That's what Paul taught. And that's what the cross of Jesus Christ did. And if it hasn't done it for you, then you're not in Christ is what Paul's saying. If it hasn't done it for you, you're not in his spirit. You're still living in the flesh. So we have to live in the Spirit. How can we do that? You can't figure it out in the flesh. You have to die to the flesh and stop thinking you can do it. It's total dependence on Christ. 
It's finally coming to the place where you realize he is the hope. Because I cannot set myself at liberty from the sin working in my, in my members. I cannot be delivered from it. I've tried to beat it. I've turned over new leaves. I've struggled against it. And yet I always find myself back there. And you will. And that's why we need Christ. That is the gospel. That is the hope. That henceforth we should not serve sin. <laughs> why? Because that body was put to death on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ died in our stead. And that body that we now live in, that vile body, was put to death with him, done by the Spirit of God, the moment we believe, we are set free from the power of sin. The power of sin. It no longer has dominion over you. Amen. Sin doesn't have dominion over you. Amen. If you're in Christ, it doesn't have dominion. You've been, you've been set free from that. And there's so many other places in Scripture where Paul talks about, Oh, death, where is thy sting? And he says the sting of death is sin. That body of death has been destroyed, put away. Forever, once for all, the Bible says. But those who are enemies of the cross do damage to the gospel by saying it's not so. It's not so. Doesn't have to be separation. Doesn't have to be just flesh and spirit and nothing in between. It is the way. It is the case. Amen. And the spirit of Christ working in us will always be driving us to confess the truth, to repent, to acknowledge, and to grow close, closer to Christ because of it. Per, always doing that work in us of conforming Christ in us. And that old man is passing away. All things are becoming new. New like you've never known them in Christ. Amen. Brother Adam,